name is Linda Smith, and I am um, representing a couple of organizations that are sponsors of this event, starting with Race Onward, uh, League of Women Voters, When She Votes, and of course the library is a partner. And then uh, through Professor Kylie, we had a sponsorship through the Reynolds Institute of uh, Journalism at Mizzou. So some wonderful sponsors, and we thank them for allowing us to pull this together and have wonderful speakers and and um, having you even on Zoom and in the audience tonight. I think it's um, almost um, a coincidence in our timing that today happens to be the last day to register voters. And for the last four days, um, I've just been running around to different venues in town uh, with volunteers and we're working on registering the voters. Um, and we've learned um, no, multiple times that it's really not the registration piece that we have trouble with in Boone County and nationwide, actually. Uh, it's getting out to vote. And so um, I want to make sure tonight that people are well aware. Of, we all know, I think, about absentee voting. I think I haven't lived in Missouri very long, but I, I think absentee voting has been around that with an excuse. Um, but because of the photo ID law that was passed a couple of years ago, and because as long as it's being held up in court, we also have a no excuse early voting option that begins on July 23rd. And you don't need any excuse. Uh, the, um, the Boone County Clerk's Office will be accommodating uh, voting in the commission chambers on the first floor of the government building. Uh, Monday through Friday for two weeks uh, during their no normal work hours. Uh, they'll also be conducting some uh, voting at Columbia Mall on June 27th, at Douglas High School on June 28th, uh, July, I'm sorry, July 27th and 28th. They'll actually be down in, in Ashland at the South Boone County Public Library and in Centralia. So there's lots of options for voting early. But I know in my own experience with registering voters, there's, there seem to be a lot of people that just love to go to the polls on election day. Uh, and that's good too. Um, and we, however you go, we're just glad. And whenever you go, we're just glad that you go. A couple little um, uh, housekeeping things. Restrooms are right down the hallway to your left. There's also a drinking fountain uh, at the restrooms. I think we still have some decaffeinated coffee left, some cookies back there, water. Help yourself, please. Even uh, feel free to, I'm going to give them permission to get up and go get another drink of water if they need to. We've got lots of, um, lots of uh, handouts too, but one that we don't have uh, that I want to make a big announcement for, the League of Women Voters is having their candidate forum next Tuesday night. That is what, July 16th at the library um, and we're starting at six o'clock. Is that right, Carol? Six o'clock. And we will have candidates from contested races in Boone County. And as importantly, we'll have somebody to speak to the three ballot uh, issues that we'll see uh, coming up uh, in this election. Don't ask me what they are. I, I know there's a child tax credit, there, there's a, uh, property tax credit, and I believe, what's the third one, Carol? Kansas City, right. Yeah, I should remember that. Um, so uh, come join us in the friends room at the library, either in person or on Zoom. We'd love to uh, love to have you. And I would be re remiss with Carol Schreiber here to not mention that the League's Voter Guide is has been published. It's on, out online on the league's website, which is lwvcbc.org. Sometimes get my letters mixed up, but it's the League of Women Voters, uh, Columbia Boone County, if you forget uh, the letters. So uh, check out the voter guide. Um, we have a couple of handouts out on the table from our misinformation and disinformation session, which was our our uh, first session four weeks ago, uh, I happened to come across an article in my one of my favorite publications, the AARP Bulletin, that I think dovetails with Scott's comments tonight on how we should be aware, 
not just of misinformation created through artificial intelligence, but scams. And it seems as though, at least what I read, that seniors are targets of these scams so often, uh, not, not just with um, people uh, assuming the role of a, a candidate's campaign, uh, but even wanting to pull you in with the old gift card trick and things like that. So pick up a copy of, uh, of that article uh, on your way up. Easy reading, one page. Uh, so now I'm going to stop sending me information. So he said, I can't call him doctor because he doesn't have a PhD, but he's very much the professor. So Scott Christensen is an associate teaching professor of management at the Trulaski School of Business at Mizzou. His interests are focused on the impact of emerging technology on society and geopolitics. Perfect. Um, he currently serves as the college's director of the Center for Entrepreneurship and Innovation, helping students turn their ideas into profitable, pro profitable products and services. Numerous teaching awards. You, I bet you aren't going to mention them, but I did read that you have received numerous teaching awards, lots of books and articles, and and uh, sometimes a commentator, a pundit uh, on media. Yes. So. Well, okay. Next slide. Well, thank you so much. Um, it's always a great honor to get to um, share what you know and to talk with others, and I always get a great opportunity to learn from audience questions as well. Um, so thank you very much for having me here tonight. Um, I have a great job at the university. I get to just teach students and geek out with them about technology. I don't have to do any of that research stuff and worry about tenure and all that kind of stuff, which is great for me. I love it. So I'm uh, very grateful for uh, the opportunity the university provides me and provides uh, opportunities to speak at places like this. I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence. A little bit closer. Okay, yeah, we got we got some Zoom people. This is uh, oh, there we go. Okay, I was worried it's going to fall out. Okay, now everybody on the Zoom can hear me. All right. Um, I get a little excited from time to time, so if I dance away from this, just uh, shout out. So I'm going to talk about artificial intelligence, and this is a topic that we could probably spend uh, I don't know a day on or a week on or a month on, or maybe a couple of semesters on as well, or maybe an entire degree program. Uh, it's a big field, but I wanna talk to you tonight uh, and give you some background information on two of the forms of artificial intelligence that probably have the most impact on our lives. Um, we'll talk about the negative impacts that they can have, but I'd also like to talk a little bit about some of the positive impacts that these things can have as well. Um, so as we get started here, let's just define artificial intelligence. So I'm going to define it as a machine, that is a computer, that um, exhibits cognitive or decision-making behavior and can take action to achieve a goal. Now, you may have seen movies where you have some sort of robot that's a humanoid and it looks like a human and it, maybe it talks like a human and maybe it seems like it has a conscious or something else. That's really um, a form of AI that does not exist in Frankly, I'm one of the skeptics. I don't think it can ever exist. It's called general AI or uh, AGI, artificial general intelligence. I don't think it's uh, actually something we're going to see in our lifetimes. So that's confined to the sci-fi movies. But what we mainly see are things that are narrow AI. So they have a very specific use, and they're usually pretty good at that use. Now, here's an example that probably my friends in computer science would not like as well, but uh, you can imagine a little vacuum uh, robot here. Uh, it Does it exhibit cognitive or decision-making behavior and take action to achieve a goal? Well, I think it does. It, I, I hit the wall. Okay, I'm going to back up. I'm going to turn a little bit. I'm going to go forward, okay? And it's trying to achieve that goal of vacuuming up your living room or smearing your dog's poop all over the entire house. So uh, I'm not sure what it's really um, trying to achieve there, but it does its best to achieve that goal. And we could imagine that, you know, you and I could probably figure this out. We could program if hit wall, back up, turn a little bit, if hit wall, go forward, so forth and so on. And for much of the 
decades that artificial intelligence has been worked on by computer scientists, this is what they were trying to do. They were trying to figure out an algorithm. How can I figure out an algorithm uh, and program that by a human that would be uh, uh, perform this function, meet the goal? But probably about 12 years ago, there were some big advances, advances in something called machine learning, where we allow the computer or the machine I don't know why we always use machine. It's always computers, but uh, we call it machine learning, not computer learning. Um, but we basically allow the computer to develop the algorithm. Right? So we let it kind of program itself in some ways. Um, now, we might tell it what to pay attention to, but often we will do some, go a little bit farther with something called deep learning, where we allow the machine to actually figure out what is the important thing to keep track of uh, when it's thinking about um, uh, the goal it wants to achieve or what's going on in this world. So let me give you uh, an example that might help you out a little bit here. Um, let me see, did I have that? Okay. So let's say that you had a wildlife camera and you would like that wildlife camera to tell you what kind of wildlife was in your backyard. Well, you, there might be a possum, there might be a raccoon, there might be a cat, or there might be a dog. You with me so far? Okay, there's going to be a test, Carol. Uh, there's going to be a test on this here in just a minute. Now, could we program an algorithm so that our machine, our computer, could tell the difference between these? We could. Yes, you're exactly right. Okay. Um, has ears that are pointy. Wait a second. That raccoon looks like it has pointy ears as well. The cat and the raccoon look somewhere in that regard, okay? So we could do this, but it would be hard, right? Okay, it'd be hard to do this. And if you all remember what Homer Simpson has said, if it's hard, it's not worth doing, okay? Now, I'm glad you all laughed at that because my students are like, yes, Professor C, you're exactly right, okay? Um, but uh, this type of thing, would actually be fairly easy for these deep learning networks to figure out. What we would do is we would train our system by getting 10,000 images of possums, raccoons, cats, and dogs, and we would label them. And we would put them into something called a neural network. Now we call this a neural network. It does not function the same as your brain. It borrows a little bit from neurobiology. But if you think of it, the input goes in over here on the left. And here we have these different cases that we want things sorted into. And we would say, okay, here's a image of a raccoon. I want you to make sure that that ends up down in case four. Okay, so we're giving it training data. We're giving it lots and lots of data. And what it would do is it would reinforce these connections at each one of these nodes in our network. There's a little bit of statistics that's going on. Okay, and my friend Gary Coles, who's a retired uh, marketing professor, would say, well, all this is is statistics. And he's not wrong. It's just statistics at a scale that's really hard for us to comprehend. Okay, so you think about each one of these connections as having some statistical analysis going into um, these images as it goes through them. So we would then have a network that we could very easily deploy and out into our backyard and it would be able to correctly identify these different animals, okay? And we would have not had to program that algorithm. We, in fact, don't even really know what it selected was really the differences between these animals, okay? But it'll work fairly reliably as long as we have a good data set. So we can do this with the image data. And here I wanted to highlight one area that I do think it's going to have a dramatic and good effect on, uh, on our lives, and that is in the healthcare industry. So if you think about where are other patterns observed sometimes, well, they're observed in things like cardiology and radiology and pathology, right? And so this is actually a fairly old paper, uh, AI beats radiologists at pneumonia detection. Okay, now here's the exam. How did it do that? Sampling. Okay, so in other words, we trained it to do that, right? So we gave it, in this case, it was 30,000 images, 30,000 images of people that we thought had pneumonia, 
And it turns out they did, because you can actually assay that with a, a bacterial type of thing. Here's 30,000 images of people that we didn't think had pneumonia, and it turns out they didn't have pneumonia. Here's also our false positives and our false negatives. Okay, And you let this thing chug away, and it figures out the differences, and then it can get a very high rate of accuracy. Okay, So this is pretty remarkable, uh, and it is changing the medical field. Another example is pathology. So if you think about a pathologist, what do they do? They look at images, and they recognize patterns. In this case, it's looking at an image of a tissue sample and saying, hey, Mrs. or Mr. Uh, pathologist, I guess that would be a doctor, doctor pathologist, um, uh, this little area here looks suspicious. You should take a look at this. Well, a machine or a computer can look at these samples 24 hours a day, so it speeds up the diagnosis significantly. And of course, if you've ever you know, had to have a biopsy, you know that you don't really feel that relaxed while you're waiting for the results, right? So speeding that up, okay? And uh, as I said, I wanted to mention that um, uh, this is one of the areas that's going to affect our lives in some good ways. So there's been over 880 AI healthcare that's of, as of a month ago, uh, was the last time I looked this up, uh, algorithms that have been approved for human use, okay? And so this is really changing these fields and is changing, uh, I think, uh, outcomes for the for the um, for the positive. But the other thing that we can do with machine learning algorithms is we can feed in things like behavioral data. We can feed in information about things that you click on on your social media. We can feed in information about what you read and how far down you scrolled when you read something. Okay. That's also collected. Maryland's having a little bit of a panic attack there, but uh, they not only know, you know, know where your mouse is. What did your mouse hover over? Did your mouse hover over some link that you didn't click? Okay, that's behavioral data. When do you browse the web? When do you shop? Okay, all that is information that can be fed in, and then can make predictions on this kind of classify you as the type of consumer or shopper you are, and what you might do next, okay? <clears throat> and so this is where um, you start to get things like Facebook. This is from a couple of years ago, where the pandemic, which was a video that was kind of a conspiracy theory uh, video about how the uh, COVID pandemic was um, artificially created and, and it was planned out in advance uh, by some um, secret world government or something like that. <clears throat> Well, why in the world would this get to such top status on something like Facebook? Well, what is Facebook, what is the this behavior that they want to encourage? Clicks, time on site, engagement, shares. If I get real agitated and mad and Larry Brown's posting something, I'm, uh, you know, I don't like that. Did you see what he did? I'm going to read something else he did. Okay. Well, that's great for Facebook because they get to sell me more ads for yogurt. So if you want to think about the motivations of any of these big social media companies or Google, is that they want to sell you yogurt. Okay. That's how they make money. You don't get, you don't pay anything to use Facebook. You give up your behavioral data. They then use that behavioral data to create a very accurate model of you, and they use it to target ads against you. This is their entire business model. Some people call it the surveillance economy. Now, this is all maybe fine and good when we're talking about Mazdas and uh, yogurt, but it's not so good when we're starting to talk about information about our democracy, information about political candidates, information about how our government works, okay? And there's all sorts of other things that compound into this. We have confirmation biases, right? Uh, I might want to believe something. Uh, and Facebook says, well, if I, if I send Scott more conspiracy stuff, he stays on the site. He must want to believe that, whether it's true or not. So none of these systems are designed 
to in any way optimize for connections with other people. They're not optimized to help you get good information or to uh, promote civic dialogue. They're optimized to sell you yogurt. Exactly. That's going to be in the final, Greg. Okay. So it's going to be in the final. I'm glad a lot of friends have showed up here. I can pick on people by name. I'll, I'll maybe get some other, other names down. Okay. So this is a, a particularly troubling area, and it's, but it's been one that's been going on for you know decades now. I guess 2008 was really when Facebook became available to everybody, or 2007. Um, so it's been going on for quite some time. You also wonder, do you guys think Facebook has gotten better or worse? Worse, okay. As far as how you feel about it, do you, do you get more stuff? you get more connections? Well, it's gotten worse. You have to stay on the site longer in order to find what you want. Okay? And it's, it's so much stuff you don't want. Right. So once again, these systems are not really designed for you. They're designed for keeping you clicking. And because of this idea that uh, you have bots that are on there and they also drive up um, engagement, they also drive up the views and everything else. <clears throat> so this is a big controversy in my area of business because if I'm an advertiser and I'm advertising with Google or with Facebook, well, I get charged when a bot clicks on my ad. Okay, I get charged when a bot looks at my ad. And in fact, Facebook has had to settle with the uh, f um, Federal Trade Commission about issues of overinflating those numbers to advertisers. Okay, and, and not talking about how many bots are on their site. Okay, so there's no real incentive to remove bots if they're posting things, if it's driving engagement, if you can still charge your advertisers for those. Okay. Okay, so now I got everybody depressed. Um, so, so delete all your social media is, is the takeaway from that. No, um, uh, it's, uh, it's just something you have to realize when you're on these sites. Um, people have looked at Google as going downhill, not being as, as good of a, a search engine. Well, people are having to make more searches to find what they're after. Well, that means you're on the site more. You get to see those ads more. Okay, so it's all about, all about the ads. So this is one disturbing way um, in which things are being uh, promoted. Um, now, certainly, do people have the right to lie? Oh, I would say, yeah, you bet, right? Um, do we have the right to uh, say things that are untrue in political campaigns? Well, that seems to be a tradition going back to Jefferson that seems to have uh, held up pr pretty well. The problem here is that algorithm or the AI is amplifying that it's just not it's not scott on his weird little website typing up stuff that he thinks and lying about people it's the fact that this is going out and getting amplified so people like me um that want to see some regulation <clears throat> um in this area say that it's not the fact that somebody posted something on their facebook page or their wall or whatever we call it now it's more that it's getting amplified Okay, that Facebook is using that material for its advertising engine, its engagement engine, its rage engine, right? Okay. Uh, so let's talk about another form of AI that you may have heard of, uh, and that's called uh, these large language models. So things like chat GPT, okay? So we might call that generative AI. So generative AI uh, is trained as well on very large data sets so it can mimic human understanding of language. Okay. It does not understand language. It does not understand the world the way a human does. Okay. But it can mimic. Just like a parrot might say, and there's a, a famous paper 
talks about stochastic parrots. So these are stochastic parrots. So what are what's a stochastic parrot? Well, stochastic is just a fancy academic word for statistics. It's a statistical parrot. But are you a statistical parrot? No. The train is leaving the, why didn't you say port or terminal or anything else? Okay. We're all a little bit of a stochastic parrot, right? So we expect certain things. It's most likely station is coming next. Okay, that's the most likely, okay? So by doing uh, this type of analysis, by uh, taking sentences, breaking them up into what are known as tokens, you often see if you're playing with these things, they'll talk about how many tokens they're capable of understanding. They, they will go through and they'll actually try to understand, well, what is this? word work, quote unquote, mean, and it derives meaning from its relationship to other words, okay? So there's, uh, it's going through and it's figuring out where does this word work appear next to? So it hoovers in billions and billions of pages of text and eventually figures out here are some of the words that work appears alongside and some that it does not tend to be associated with, like work hoka. And it basically does some statistics. Once again, my friend Gary would be right, it's just statistics, but it's at a scale that's really hard for us to under, understand. Can you imagine every single word in the English language has been studied in this way by these computers? Yeah, right. Pardon me, let me need you to use the mic for the folks. Oh, I'm in. sorry. Uh, got it. This large language model, if I understand what you're saying, is what does the predictions when you're writing an email or, or as text. Is that correct? Yeah, exactly. So it's a, it's a train leaving the station, right? It's, it's trying to figure out. So even predictive text on your phone, that is a predicting what might come next. But uh, with ch systems like ChatGPT, you see this at a scale that's really hard to understand, okay? And um, hopefully you've had a chance to use ChatGPT. Uh, and if not, we're gonna go ahead and use it right here. I just need to do a quick little switch here. Where am I? Okay, there I am. And then I'm gonna reshare this screen so you all get to see it again. And I should have um, done this a little differently, uh, but I got it here. for the delay here. Okay. So this is ChatGPT. Now there is a free version. I have the version that does um, I pay for because I do a lot of these kind of demos and stuff like that. Um, if you haven't played with it, you should certainly play with it. Um, so um, who is Larry Brown in Columbia? Missouri. Okay. You're an ordained minister. All right. Is this true? Pretty good. Okay. Okay, so um, it's able to um, figure out who Larry Brown is, but what's interesting is, um, I don't know how much of it's your writing it knows about either, but um, tell me a story about AI in the style of, oops, style of T F of Larry Brown. I can't tell stories the way Larry can, um, or I'd give this a go. Get a mirror to our deepest fears. Now, students and professors engage with the lies and so forth and so on. 
Um, now, I don't know how accurate this is. Um, it might, if I had made up some other name, it might have come up with something similar. But you can certainly ask it to do something in the style of uh, Harry Potter, for example. And it would tell you about a wizard and all this other stuff. Um, we, could, we could once again spend one of our days um, that we're going to talk about AI, talking about uh, copyright infringement. But let's just, uh, you know, notice, um, notice that what it can spit out. Now, uh, if you haven't used these systems before, uh, it is kind of like talking with a human in that if you're going to change the subject, you want to be explicit about it. Because I don't want to be talking about um, this story. Uh, I'm going to switch sides here. Okay. So let's do something that's more political. Uh, write a story uh, for the Missouri Independent. And if I spell stuff wrong, uh, it will know. Uh, in the style of Rudy Keller about um, a candidate for um, dog catcher in Boone County. Uh, named Prof C, uh, who was caught in a secret recording saying that he hates hedgehogs. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I heard somebody in the audience say about students writing papers. Um, this is, uh, yeah, you can imagine, right, every professor was kind of terrified uh, when they saw this coming. Now, I encourage my students to learn how to use this. And so um, we talked to them about um, how to use these things. Um, for most practical things, it tends to get you 40 to percent there, 40 to 60 percent there. Um, I use it sometimes for brainstorming if I'm stuck when am I writing, stuff like that. But it's not, um, we might look at this and say it's great, but as you start to get um, further along in it, you're going to find that it has some deficits. It uses a lot of over-exaggerated words, and um, you can tell it to, you know, write more simply if you want. So you could obviously produce things in mass, um, that would be fake, right? So it'd be very easy to fake something. There's also, this is a commercial product. There's also on the dark web something called fraud GPT. And what I can do is I can feed in all the information that I know about an individual. So I'll pick on biology, my dean. Let's say all the information I know about him, all the public information, and say, I want to write a phishing email to a scam email. And I want him, him to click on this link. Okay. Help me write that. Okay. And it'll help you do that. Okay. So it is very dangerous in many different ways because it's a democratizing tool. Yes, it allows me to quickly write these great articles, um, but it also allows people to do nefarious things, right? So this technology is being used um, in this way. The other thing that you might think of when you think of generative AI is, um, and I think I can do this and be a little more efficient this time. There we go. Is the area of deep fakes. Okay. So let's, uh, deep fakes are also a form of generative AI, except they work often with voice or they work with images or video. Um, I think I should this correctly. Okay, I'm going to optimize for video. Um, so a deep fake is a synthetic performance that appears to be that of a real known or unknown person. 
Here's a, a deep fake of President Obama. We won't play the whole thing, but. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So. Uh... Okay, so this was produced about four and a half years ago. It took about 30 people about a month to do, okay? A lot of technology involved, a lot of computer scientists, folks like that. It is a facial swapping uh, with a guy named jo Jordan Peele. That's a time when we need to rely on trusted news sources. It may sound basic, but how we move forward. You would notice some artifacts around the uh, edges uh, if you said it carefully. Would you study it carefully? Maybe not, right? But experts could tell. Um, one of the things about all these tools is they're digital and they tend to get better at an exponential rate. We're not used to that in our world. If I do one sit up today and I do two tomorrow, Am I going to do four the next day, and then I'm going to do eight, and I'm going to do 16, I'm going to do 32, I'm going to do 64, 128, 256. I'm going to do 500, Greg, in a week from now, I'm going to do 512 per day, and then it's 1,024, and then it's 2,000 something or other. Yeah, 48, thank you. Uh, so uh, we don't experience that, okay? But they uh, also become cheap, easy, and democratized. That means available to many. Okay. This is another deep fake. This one is probably two and a half years old. Was done by just one person in 24 hours. Very technical person. Chris Umi is the guy who did it. Um, but watch this one. In this reel, you're going to see my amigo, Chris Umi. <laughs> He's going to introduce to you the wonderful world of deepfakes, how AI and VFX are unlocking the future of our imagination. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? So very good quality. You don't see any of that kind of blurring or anything around the cheeks. Um, obviously very, very well done. Was done for entertainment purposes. Um, let's continue along this continuum. I guess we continue along a continuum. Um, and let's look at one that's probably I think this one is probably eight to 12 months old. Skip ahead just a oh. Oh. And what is your talent? So, a company is called Metaphysic, and we use artificial intelligence to create hyper real content. And so, we're going to invite our good friend, Daniel Emmett, on stage, who you guys are familiar with from a previous season. I remember who Daniel is. And we're going to show the audience something kind of amazing. How are you, everybody? Nice to see you. Hi. Nice to see you. You were on how many years ago? Four years ago. And you were amazing. And you were a very good singer. So how did you meet? We met because, of course, I'm fans of what they do online, and they're fans of AGT. And when they asked me to be a part of this wonderful, unique, original thing they're going to do, I couldn't say no. Well, look, you're very mysterious. I don't want to ask anything else. Good luck. OK, Daniel, take it away. Thank you so much. Good luck. Thank you, guys. What did they put together? That is quite a camera.
once again, see that exponential growth in, in now doing it in real time, essentially real time. Still not very good, okay? But as I said, that's probably close to a year ago. There was a case about three months ago where $35 million was stolen from a business by deep faking the chief financial officer on a Zoom call, okay? So the chief financial officer was there in the Zoom and was saying transfer this money or whatever, okay? So those are high value targets, right? But um, this is part of the problem. It's gonna, it becomes democratized, okay? Um, so there are some good uses for this technology. Um, but, but let's, we can, we can address those if we want. Uh, but let me uh, come here and uh, go back to our idea about uh, who's going to win this particular race for uh, dog catcher. So here's my original audio. I hate hedgehogs. Oh. I think they are so ugly. I'm sorry, that's not my original. That's my altered. Okay, but that sounds like me, right? We'll play it once more. I hate hedgehogs. I think they are so ugly. Here's my original. I love hedgehogs. I think they are so cute. Okay. So being able to take my voice and alter what I've said. Okay. Let's look at an example that's not contrived, if I can. I, I'll, uh, okay, here we go. And I wanna tell you about my husband. About my name is Jill Biden. And I want to tell you about my husband, Joe. Joe is the world's biggest cheerleader for the atrocities happening now in Gaza. The United States stands with Israel. Right now, the right-wing extremist government of Israel. Okay, so this is Jill Biden. They didn't deep fake the video, but the audio was altered. And then obviously video from the... Uh, conflict there was put in, making it sound like she disagrees with her husband's policies. So this is, you know, you can kind of see when we talk about misinformation here, well, I saw that, I heard her, it was her voice. So we're entering kind of a zero trust world, okay, um, I'm afraid. Now, for things like Jill Biden, things like Joe Biden or, or, or President Trump, these um, people are followed a lot, right? So those types of deep fakes tend to get taken down uh, fairly quickly. So um, they're not maybe uh, as dangerous uh, in some ways, but what does it really feed into? Distrust. What about my confirmation bias, right? What about if I see an altered video of Joe Biden? Does it feed into my confirmation that, oh, he's, he's old or he doesn't know what's going on? If I see one of Trump that's been altered in some way to you know, say something bad or whatever, does that feed into my confirmation bias? Yeah. So we have our own filters and a problem is that these things play on our own filters. Right. Um, now, going back to the idea of scams that was mentioned, um, here's another one where I have not altered my voice, but I have made this computer machine say something um, that I never said at all. Hi, Mom. I don't have time to talk, but I need you to text me your license number. Yeah, sorry that's so low, but it says, hi, mom, I don't have time to talk, but I need you to text me your license number, okay? Sense of urgency. Um, I, here's the information, critical information I need from you, 
Okay. Think about a deep fake voice of me calling my mom and saying, I, I went to the league thing tonight. And I don't know. They, the cops say that I, I hit somebody and I don't know what's going on, but they said that, you know, there's this lawyer, Ava's not available right now. Can you talk to this lawyer? Okay. This is the type of scams that are coming. So uh, I tell my students, try to think about protecting your families from these things. Have a code word, hedgehog. No, don't use hedgehog. Uh, so um, have a code word, have some sort of system in place. Know where, know where uh, people are. Um, phishing emails probably send tens of thousands of dollars out of Boone County every day. Uh, my friend that's uh, head of the cyber crimes task force for um, in the sheriff's office, she'll get these calls and say, well, my mom was scammed out of $2,000. And she says, you know, I'm, I'm very sorry, you know, I, but I'm dealing with murders, crimes against children. I can't spend the time. I'll listen to, to the person. Okay. So this is a real, real problem. I try to get my students involved and, and motivated to um, help. Now I've been talking, I wanna talk about just a few more things and then I'll kind of open it up for questions here because I'm, I, um, a lot of this is maybe not, um, uh, that inspiring. <laughs> uh, let me see here. Um, so there's, um, there's also, uh, this is an actual video of Biden, but some people said that, oh, it must be a deep fake because he's talking well and he's being, you know, looks strong and everything. And uh, so therefore it must be a deep fake, okay? So deep fakes so confusion in multiple ways. Let's go back to that example of me saying that I hate hedgehogs. Um, I hate hedgehogs. I think they are so ugly. So let's say I actually said that and it was recorded. And you want to comment on that? It was a deep fake. That was a deep fake of me. Fred Perry, my opponent, has made a deep fake of me and he's put this out on the internet because he he's, you know, uh, I, I know Fred and he would allow me to, to, uh, uh, tease him like this. Um, but uh, you, you see what I'm saying? It's called the liar's dividend. I get a benefit. I'm a liar. I get a dividend. I get something back for there being misinformation in the world, for there being distrust. Because then to my supporters, I can say, no, no, still vote for me. I love those hedgehogs. Um, that was a deep fake. Okay. So we're getting very complicated here. There are... Um, some other ways that this is used, um, you may have heard of non-consensual pornography that's been created. Um, this is a crime against women. Um, there's been a few examples against men, but it's mainly uh, a crime against women, often to intimidate them. This was a journalist that was in the Middle East, uh, and this deep fake pornography was made of her. She was also doxxed, meaning that her um, address was provided and so this can be extremely dangerous situation uh, for a journalist like this. Um, so it's often used to, to intimidate uh, as a method of intimidation. Uh, unfortunately, our General Assembly did not pass a um, law this year um, uh, forbidding deep fakes, uh, or at least criminalizing deep fakes rather. Um, this is kind of a hodgepodge of laws. Uh, if you were to create a deep fake of me um, and it was part of some harassment or intimidation, those laws could be used to get, go against you, but just the fact that you created a deep fake this is not. Now, I would argue that this is a different type of crime. Okay, this is a very personal type of crime, and I think it should be treated differently in our criminal code. Um, Congress is looking at this as well. So, uh, yeah, so on that happy note, my name is uh, Prof C, and I do have links to a lot of this here uh, if you want to go to this uh, profcnews.com. Um, I thought we could play some more with these systems if you wanted, but I did want to leave plenty of time for kind of questions. Um, you know, I, sometimes we get a lot of technology questions along the way. So.
I've got a mic here, so I'll pass it around. Yes, Larry. Um, he's got to come over there. So how does the average person, not necessarily one who has their name and their picture and so on out there, how do they go get information from you so that can be used in various kinds of uh, things, fakes, deep fakes? Uh, so uh, that would be, now for someone like you, there's lots of audio, right. there's lots of video. Right. Um, so limiting the audio and video that's out there, um, limiting um, you know posts to Instagram, limiting uh, posts to YouTube, other places like that, uh, will limit the amount of material to be able to be trained on these systems. So can contact with you via the phone or your internet or is there folks out there getting that information oh, are they listening to you um, listening watching etc yeah uh no i don't believe so uh frankly it's uh, uh there's too many other easy targets you know for scamming and things like that it's it scammers want to get the money quickly they don't want to work hard at it all right yeah i think somebody else had a question yeah I, I was curious why you encourage your students to use chat GTP. Is it just the nature of the course courses you're teaching? Um, I think it's an interesting tool. Um, I think that we have to, uh, I want them to analyze whether this is a useful tool or not. So the way I do it, um, it is not a writing course, okay? But they do have to do some writing. And like every week they usually have a little two page paper they have to write. So not very complicated. I don't grade like I'm an English professor or something. But um, I encourage them to, to test this out because then they get to see like where it makes errors, okay? Uh, and so the, the caveat is that you have that two-page paper and then you have to have an end note with everything you did and your analysis of it. That can go on for 20 pages sometimes where here's what I pasted, here's what I came back, it made this error, I, I tried it again, here's what I did. You know, I think this was more waste of time than it was worth, some people, some students conclude. So that's been my approach. Um, there's been other approaches, some people just forbid it outright. The problem is that there's these detectors that will claim that they can detect AI writing, but um, it's not clear that they do. Uh, and it's also easy to trick, right? So I can tell ChatGPT, please insert some errors, you know, some spelling errors. Um, I can tell it, you know, um, to write like I'm um, at a seventh grade re reading level. Okay. I think this can have some very interesting applications. So for example, the last time I had to sign a contract of any significance, I don't know what I signed. <laughs> You know, I mean, look, think of all the things you've had to agree to for your service level agreements or when you're buying a house. I mean, what was in those house contracts? I don't know. I mean, you, you assume that the people aren't, you know, your your bank isn't scamming you, right? But what if you could say, hey, explain this to me like I'm a five-year-old, okay? That might be very useful. Or for example, um, you know, going to the doctor, okay? Um, explain this in a very simple story, what's going on with this person's body. So even doctors might use this. Doctors are using these to try to synthesize their notes, okay? It helps them get those notes done much faster or instructions to patients. However, one of the things I tell my students is never ask an AI something you don't already know the answer to or are willing to look up. And so the doctor though knows whether that's true or not. They can review it and say, yep, those are instructions I wanna to send to Scott. And I think that will, that, that's exactly what he has and we'll explain it well to him. So I think there's gonna be some very interesting uses for these, but once again, I don't, I think we're a long ways off from like turning over some of these jobs to AI. I think that uh, has been overhyped. I think we're gonna to have to rejigger our work for any of these tools to be useful in it. Yeah. So we're, we're, we're in election season now. What are your recommendations for people? Because disinformation anyway is out there, whether using AI or not, just people. 
Yeah, um, I hate to go back to this, um, but it's those reliable sources. So, um, you know, going to major newspapers, uh, our good locations. Um, you know, I tell my students, if you, if you don't like, uh, you know, Wall Street Journal, that's generally considered on one end of the spectrum on the editorial page. Their reporting is great. Okay, just stay off the editorial page if you don't like that. Okay, same with New York Times. If you don't like the editorial page, you usually have a little bit better sports, but you know, read read one of those. Doesn't matter. AP, you know, all those types of places, kind of original sources. Unfortunately, there aren't as many of those left. We're very lucky to have the Columbia Missourian um, here be a, a good paper still here in the in a daily that we get, not just a weekly. Yeah, Rick. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry, we skipped over you. You had a question. Theology. Mm -hmm. That is a hype. A previous example, you showed radiology. Yes. And they had the high examples of use of AI. And I would, I was just wondering why? Do you know anything more yeah. about that? Yeah. Uh, the, the radiology, because a lot of radiologists, they look at their findings. So this is what they call them. So it can be an x-ray, it can be an MRI, it can be um, a CAT scan, any number of other types of things. It's usually represented in a visual form. So they're actually able to see something like an ultrasound, you know, all, all those things are visual, right? Well, they also have a huge amount of existing labeled data that says, here's an x-ray of somebody with this malady, and here's another x-ray. So they have a huge existing data set that can be easily anonymized. So they might take my name off of it. And they would say, well, here's an x-ray of some gentleman that presented with uh, you know, a pneumonia. Um, so they have a huge data set to go off of. Um, cardiology is, I think, the number two. So they're looking at these little lines on graphs. Well, those are patterns as well. They're looking at for certain patterns. And so um, those are the areas where you're doing pattern recognition, which is like recognizing the raccoon versus the cat. You're recognizing the pattern, right? It's not always 100%, but um, you know, neither are radiologists. Yeah. yeah. Since the election season was mentioned earlier, uh, I'm thinking about uh, <clears throat> this was, I think, three weeks ago when, when there was a deep fake uh, video of the current sitting president, and there was a big hoopla between the two parties about whether it was a fake or not, and the RNC finally came out and said, we did it. Yeah. Okay, but there was a week or two period where you didn't know whether it was real or not, and people who were going to what I consider pretty reputable sources weren't getting a straight answer either. How do you deal with this kind of stuff? Uh, well, uh, I, um, uh, I don't have a clear answer for you. I mean, one of the most dangerous things was what I think it was in, uh, um, I think it was in New Hampshire the night before the primary that um, a deep fake deep fake audio call of Biden went to Democratic voters telling them, don't worry, kind of like this is malarkey or I, I've got this, don't vote. So the other way that um, you're going to see this used is to dissuade people from voting, from turning out. So right. Oh, yeah. So he's just talking about the fact that uh, the trial for those um, uh, uh, robocalls is going on right now. But, um, yeah, the problem is that, that that robocall was probably one of the best uses of deep fake, if you will, because they strategically did it before anybody could fact check it. OK. And also those robocalls. You know, they've been used for a lot of dishonest campaigns in the past because uh, it's targeting you. Now, do you remember to get your phone and hit record when you get a robocall? Some political folks here in Boone County will do that, 
Okay, they'll they'll recognize I don't see the number and they'll record everything and then they'll they'll try and send it to their party's headquarters or something like that. But it's very rare to catch those things. So that was probably the perfect use strategically of that deep fake. And so you can imagine the same sort of thing saying, boy, I'm not going to convince those Democrats or not, not going to convince those Republicans to vote for the other side, but maybe I could convince them not to turn out. Okay. So reduce their enthusiasm. So I think we're going to see, uh, if we see it, it's going to be that type of stuff. I don't think um, at this point in the way um, our divide is in the country, I don't think uh, anybody's trying to persuade. It's going to be more about turnout. And uh, how can, curb enthusiasm. How can I get the black voters to not turn out or in this particular area? How can I get the suburban moms to not turn out in this area? Yeah. Uh, while we're here at uh, Boone County Electric, would you mind touching on some of the impacts of power consumption that AI is having and some things we need to be aware of in that regard? Yeah, so um, that's a, uh, the, the, the question was uh, power consumption. These, uh, uh, so every time I make a query into ChatGPT, it uses a fair amount of, of power. Um, the uh, the problem is when you start to compare these things, we're using them for non-productive uses right now. So people are playing with it. If you were to write a uh, five page article at your computer, that would use some amount of power as well. So when we start to look at these, it does become somewhat difficult. Um, uh, I'm very conscious of those uh, power issues as well. But um, the projection is that they will start to use an enormous amount of power. So right now, um, data centers use about 2% of the world's energy, uh, and that's predicted to grow to 5% of the world's energy. So um, that's, uh, yeah, that's a, that's a huge issue. And of course, our energy grid is getting more strained all the time, so. And there's, yeah. Um, there's all sorts of other equity issues um, around different countries and uh, different uh, peoples, yeah. So you are a teacher and you use um, AI in your classes. Uh, you mentioned some teachers who teach writing or I taught a foreign language. Um, if a student is asked to write a story in German, and comes with something, how is, my question is basically, how is this changing teaching and learning in those subjects where they are developing a skill, one would hope? Um, yeah, so it's not, you're not gonna like it. It's not good. Um, some professors are starting to go back to blue books. Okay, if you remember blue books, you know, that you wrote in, okay. Um, Google Docs is something that um, will actually track changes with time. So you can actually track the changes and you can see that how they made those edits over time. And you can do that relatively fast. Um, some people are having them write in, in uh, classes as well. Um, but it's, um, it's very difficult. Now, you and I both know that students have cheated long before ChatGPT. They just paid somebody. And in fact, when I first showed this to my students, um, one of the students said, this is great because this is a and democratizing for those of us that didn't have the money to pay somebody to write our essay, okay? So <laughs> there's multiple perspectives on this, okay? So, um, but that's one of the reasons I think, you know, you're kind of, you're going to use it. Let's use it together. Okay. Let's figure out where it's useful, where it's not, but, but I understand. My follow-up question is how is this changing people as they, how is this changing education and those who are educated? How is this changing our society? Yeah. And um, when I talk with business leaders, I often uh, tell them that they should think more like the Amish, right? The Amish don't, refuse to use or the, uh, you know, people that are kind of, we associated in that class, I'm probably using the wrong terms, but um, they might use power drills, right? They might use rechargeable drills. They might use certain things, but they think about it. How is this going to change things? 
I think if we were as a society to go back to 2007 and say, hey, we're about to unleash this Facebook thing, we're going to have all your kids are going to have mobile phones they are going to be glued to like crazy. Isn't this awesome? We would say, go away. Who the hell ever came up with this idea? And I don't want to talk to you again. Right. So but instead, it kind of seeps and creeps. OK, this is a little bit different in that it's kind of exploded onto the scene. OK. Um, and. Uh, you know, you know, uh, you sometimes get to be like paranoid about students cheating and stuff. Uh, if you talk to them, a lot of them, you know, think seriously about this stuff too. So I think it's um, I, I'm really worried about the AI detection software being overused by faculty because we're now starting to get more distrust. Okay, and as you know, uh, relationships go better when you trust each other. Right. So that's. Um, yeah, I don't have an answer for that either. It's going to be a rough time for higher ed in the next five to 10 years. It's a very rough time for multiple reasons. Yeah. I think Kathy had one in the back. Well, from your demonstration of how easily a report was generated. I can see that if someone wants to start a conspiracy theory and then someone types in information and uses some key words, I don't know, pick something from the past. Did Hillary Clinton kill babies? You know, you could you could put that in there and then click on it and it would generate an article all about it. Right. And then you could click on another site and another article all about it would come forward. And so this particular oh, yeah, conspiracy that would... theory would just be validated. But this, you're right about the sources. They aren't from any sources like the New York Times. But still, I think that. Well, yeah, that's it's even worse than that. Uh, so in, in 2016, there were a lot of people in uh, Eastern European countries that got paid to produce websites that would have misinformation on them. And those were written. Um, I can just write a script that will just churn this out and I, you know, go get coffee and 10,000 articles have been written and on 40 different websites. So, and they've been backdated and clearly the evidence is there. It's, yeah, it's just amazing. So, so we're, I think we also need to talk to each other more. That's one thing I didn't said. We need to talk to each other. We need to talk with people we disagree with uh, more, um, listen to each other rather than waiting to talk. So uh, it's difficult to do, but yes, there's another question. So for those of us from olden times, I've, I've begun calling myself a relic. So, you know, being R -R -L. Um, you know, you always had to cite your sources. Mm. And in fact, you refer to the New York Times, Wall Street uh, Journal, et cetera. So on a fake, can you just make up your source and say this appeared in the New York Times or... Yeah, so um, early on, ChatGPT would do this reg fairly regularly. So it's called a hallucination. And so hallucinations are, um, we don't call it lying because it's not, doesn't have a conscious, it's not like a three-year-old that knows what's true and what's not. Um, it, we say it hallucinates. So um, this has been a um, big controversy. Um, and because we don't know where it's gotten that information from. So it will sometimes make up sources. This is one called perplexity, and you can try this out for free as well. Um, people have also called these plagiarism machines, um, but, um, okay. Okay, so I wrote, uh, write an essay about Harry Truman in World War I. Okay, he'll come back with a pretty good essay here. But what it's going to do is it's going to try to find sources. So this is trying to solve that particular problem. And so um, it is now going to write a nice essay for me. But you'll notice it doesn't really use footnotes correctly, but it's saying, here's where I derive this information from. 
So it's still a plagiarism machine, but it's just showing its work. So, so uh, anyway. So it's, yeah, hey, Larry. Oh, where's the mic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So years ago, the field of medical ethics appeared and disciplines and courses of professors. And we've had business and professional ethics and programs and disciplines. Are we now at a point where we're going to talk about AI ethics and will this be a, a new field oh, yeah. of study? Uh, yeah. So um, there is a lot um, being done in this field right now. One is to remove that kind of black box, have explainable AI. How did you come up with this? How did you come up with this decision? Um, uh, going back to the idea of identifying animals that I started out with, there's also been uses of this for facial recognition. Well, there's been four or five people that have been arrested for this that um, have been all African-American. Okay, so these systems are not as good on uh, faces that are African-American as they are on you know, my face um, that has to do with the training set and it has to do with the way um, computers understand images. So yeah, there's a huge, um, there's a huge effort in this. Um, uh, Coded Bias is a um, documentary um, that you can, I think you can still watch on Netflix um, for free. Um, Joy Bilwani has um, a, uh, uh, also another book called Unmasking AI. Um, uh, this, uh, of course, is going to take me to Amazon, but um, this is the book. Um, uh, check it out from the, the library. Uh, I think it does a very good job of helping you understand in layman's terms uh, what some of the problems are. Okay, algorithmic bias. So this is what we talk about uh, in some aspects of ethics. So you can imagine things like, uh, are we gonna use this to make loans, right? Well, are we just gonna have redlining, but it's now computer redlining, okay? Uh, what if I don't get my contract next year for teaching and the university says, well, this is because, um, you know, the algorithm said that you weren't a good teacher. Well, tell me why. Well, we can't because it's a black box, okay? And there's some uses of this where um, there was a college who was actually using this for college admissions. Now, I think their intentions were good. I read about the case because they said, people on admissions committees have biases and we want to remove those. However, if we had a bias in our training set, yeah, so uh, one of the things I will mention is, uh, you know, using AI in my class, um, the first week we write the policy on how it will be used in class together. The students decided that I could not use AI for grading because I showed them that it would be very easy for me to just pop in their paper and it would spit back a grade for me. They said that, uh, no, uh, I was being paid to teach and I needed to teach. And that was part of the drudgery of teaching uh, is that I needed to sit in my office and grade these things. Uh, and they also felt it was important for somebody to be held accountable, right? Rather than me going, nah, I don't know, got to be, you know, that's what it says. So, um, yeah, there's all sorts of ethical issues. Yeah. And there would also be an ethical issue if I'm uploading your paper into one of these things, where does that go? You know, what happens to it? So there's been data leaks like that as well. I don't have permission to necessarily do that from the university. I'm bound by the FERPA laws for disclosure, right? So anyway, so you, uh, we're gonna do this every night for the next 40 years, now 40 days, 400 days, no. So there's lots and lots of stuff we can go uh, into. Um, so my- um, Scott, can I ask you one question? Yeah, sure. Um, so. It, 
if I understand, I, I can understand like the music industry is now coming out and you can't use my material because it's copyrighted. But I, as a private citizen, if there's information about me that's out in public domain, it I have no recourse. Yes, no, if you showed us Larry. Right, the, the, and, those are making their way through the courts right now. Yeah. Yeah, so... Um, I could study Larry's storytelling technique and I could write up something that would be similar, right? I could do that as a human, but now it's being done at a scale and at a speed that we haven't seen before. And so is that copyright infringement? Well, derivative works like that are generally considered not copyright infringement, right? It's kind of like fan fiction. If I write a, um, a fictional account of Harry Potter and distribute it, as long as I don't chart, you know, charge people for it, I can do that. Right. So, good question. Um, so this is, um, if you go to that, you'll get to my email, you'll get to where if you want to schedule a meeting with me, uh, you're more than welcome to. It has a little newsletter where I write about AI from time to time. Uh, all of it's free. Uh, I like to geek out about this kind of stuff. So, um, you know, Greg and I have lunch sometimes and geek out about this stuff. So always happy to provide more information. Or if you're looking for specific information or guidance, just send me an email and I'll be happy to provide the resources I have. So on teaching, Mizzou Online has some fantastic resources about that. So, all right. Well, I think we're just about out of time. So um, I'll hang around if you got any more questions, but thank you all so much. And just a reminder, uh, this is all recorded, all, all three of these sessions and this one uh, I have been recorded and will be available on our YouTube channel uh, with the Daniel Boone Regional Library, as well as the uh, League of Women Voters um, channel as well. So, all right, bye-bye. <laughs>